Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the podcast version of Trey's Variety Hour is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. Um, okay, I've got a bad internet situation, everybody. I apologize. Um, my name is Trey. Welcome to the Hangout. Uh, this is going to be very cool. Uh, this is an area I know very little about, uh, space photography. And our special guest tonight is Ron Garan, uh, the famous NASA astronaut who has amassed more than a million followers, maybe the most followed astronaut ever. Uh, so that's really exciting. Uh, we're all happy to have him. And we also have invited a ton of great uh, space photographers, all kind of land-based people like me that just dream of the things Ron can do. And everyone's going to be sharing their space photos and talking about it, asking tech questions and art questions, just kind of loosely hanging out. Um, and I, again, I apologize for my situation. I... Uh, if I fall, if I drop out, I put Gordon Lang in charge of taking this thing over. Uh, I was just out. I'm in Santa Cruz right now, and I was out shooting a sunset. And I thought I would have good bandwidth, but I've I stopped in this cafe that's full. Of, well, there's a lot of different kind of people here, <laughs> and I want to know that it just if I drop, I, I'm sorry. Uh, Gordon will take over, and uh, we'll just keep on going. Ah, Jim Goldstein has joined us. Um, so let's start with introductions. Uh, no one man is any more important than any other one man, even though I wish we had a few gals in here to class it up a little bit. So sorry about that, the viewing audience. Uh, let's start with Ron and say hello to, uh, to him. Hello, Ron. Hey, Trey. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Um, I, I'm a little bit uh, out of place here because I'm the uh, only real amateur photographer amongst the group. So. <laughs> <laughs> now, what is? Tell us about this tour you just got back from. You were over in Europe uh, talking to students and stuff, right? Well, I, actually, I just got back from DC, but the week before that, I was in uh, England, and uh, yeah, we were traveling around talking to uh, to mostly students, um, but we also did a uh, TED talk out there um, in uh, Salford Keys, just next to Manchester. Uh, but, but like I said, we just got back from D.C. Uh, a couple days ago where we were, again, we we're giving presentations and uh, we having some meetings up on the hill and things like that. Well, that's cool. I, uh, you say you're an amateur, but, I mean, we all envy you like crazy. Um, <laughs> well, I've had some good opportunities. Yeah, I, I'm afraid. I don't want this to turn into one of those, uh, that you know that Chris Farley skit, Saturday Night Live, where he has famous actors on? He says, remember that movie you did? That was that was awesome. That's kind of what I feel like. <laughs> um, let's say hi to uh, Jim Goldstein. Hello, Jim. How are you? How's it going? Good. Uh, tell, tell people about yourself and tell them about your website and, and that sort of thing. Okay, sure. Um, so... As you know now, I'm, I'm Jim Goldstein, and I, I run a blog called jmg-galleries.com. I'm a full-time uh, professional photographer uh, based out of San Francisco. Uh, just got done uh, releasing an ebook uh, on uh, basically shooting time. It includes star trails and a lot of astrophotography type stuff, and just out there to inspire people. So just love photography, love talking about it, uh, so I appreciate the invite. Sure. Uh, here is your book. Let me go ahead and show this to people because I think everyone loves uh, space photography <coughs> in it. This is over at flatbooks.com. It's called Photographing in the Fourth Dimension. And it's a wonderful book by Jim. Everyone that reads it loves it. And if you want to learn more about how to take photos like that, uh, Jim is a great teacher and it's highly uh, recommended. So thanks for writing that, Jim. That thing is awesome. Thanks. Thanks for referring it. Oh, well, sure. Of course. No problem. Uh, let me see. Who's next? How about just randomly? Let's just go left to right now. Um, hello, Ben. Hey, yes. Uh, my name is Ben Canales, and I'm a landscape astrophotographer, kind of an obsessive hobbyist that uh, is now slowly becoming a full-time thing, so I'm really excited about that. 
I've uh, been doing it for a little over three years now, originally from the East Coast where light pollution is terrible and uh, moved out here to Oregon in the Pacific Northwest and uh, the discovery of the stars and the chance to take photos of them has just been fantastic. Cool. Nice to meet you. Uh, now, Brad. Hey, guys. Thank you again, Trey, for having us and putting us all together. Uh, my name is Brad Goldpaint. Uh, you can find my work at uh, goldpaintphotography.com. Uh, I just recently moved to Bend, Oregon, and uh, starting in about two, three weeks, I'm going to start uh, offering workshops to take people out and show them about how to photograph the night sky and take advantage of all the areas around Oregon. So really looking forward to that. Um, I fell in love with the night sky when I hiked um, half of the Pacific Crest Trail a few years back and uh, been shooting the night sky ever since. Awesome. Okay, and now you, Daryl. Hello, Daryl. How you doing? It's an uh, honor to be here. I uh, was really pumped when I heard that you were having Ron Duran on here. Uh, that's awesome. Seeing some of his shots during the, uh, the early days. Um, anyways, um, Daryl Van Gaal. Uh, I very much call myself an amateur photographer. Uh, only been into photography itself, uh, where I got serious about a uh, little less than a year ago. Um, started at the same time with uh, astrophotography. Uh, I've always had a love of the stars, uh, so I wound up getting a, uh, a very small apochromatic triplet telescope. Uh, it's total of, uh, I think, about 480 millimeters of focal length, uh, and started doing uh, uh, deep sky photography of uh, the deep space objects. Uh, last few weeks I've been, been trying to get some uh, star trails uh, some more wide field stuff, but it, it's very location specific. I'm in not too bad of an area, but uh, some of the pictures that uh, the other people here in the, the hangout have are, are just amazing. Uh, I'm getting the opportunity in a few months to, to head up to northern Ontario, which is actually on the, uh, the Google light pollution map as a, a totally clear sky, so I'm really looking oh. forward to that. So it's actually during a, a new moon cycle as well. So <coughs> Even better. Cool. Um, and in the fourth square is the newly uh, unbearded Dave Veffer, my <laughs> excellent producer in Parspatu. Hello, Dave. Hello, Trey. Everybody can find me at plusdave.com, and that's pretty much it. All right. Thank you for helping me put this together. You know, when we, I put up a post earlier this week, I said, does anyone know interesting space photographers? We've got so many suggestions, and I, I really had trouble deciding, so Dave, Dave fell out with it that and got Simple this amazing crew, so thank you, Dave. No problem. Um, and now Gordon. Hello, Gordon. Hello, Trey. Thanks for having me. My name's Gordon. I'm not worthy. Um, <laughs> I'm so excited to be on this hangout. I follow all of you guys. And when when Train Dave was saying, oh, you know, can you you know can you pick out a guy who does this or a guy a gal does this style of photography? I was like, how about this one? No, we've got him on the show. How about this one? No, we've got him on the show. So I'm really excited to, to meet all you guys. And I think, in Ron, I mean, this book, this book says it all. I'm, I'm a bit of a fan. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you've got one of these. This is, I'll be tucking in on, the, on this during, the, uh, the, during today's slide. <laughs> and it's also, I mean, I have to say, it's such an honor because it's so convenient as well because I've never managed to, to nail that lunch with an astronaut at Kennedy Space Center. So this is even better. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm really pleased. The reason I'm here professionally, hopefully, is I run a site called CameraLabs.com. My job is to review digital cameras. This week's camera is the Canon G1X, which is uh, their first uh, portable camera with a large sensor. And immediately after this hangout, I'm going to be posting some high ISO comparisons with this. So if you're interested in this camera and how it compares to a smaller sensor or a DSLR, you can check that out. In terms of astrophotography, that's what actually got me into photography in the first place. I inherited uh, my dad's SLR camera when I was, oh, I was only about 12, 13 years old. And the first thing I did was point it straight upwards into the night sky and do long exposures and infuriate my mum, who just wanted pictures of my sister and the family. And instead I was saying, look, mum, more little lines and dots. And uh, <laughs> she wasn't that excited, but it formed the man you see before you today. So it's hmm. a pleasure to be here. Cool. Nice to see you. Um, and last is uh, Randy. Hi, Randy. Randy, can you hear me over? You might be muted. So click the little unmute thing on top of the Hangout so we can hear you. 
Can you hear us? Uh oh. Like he's having a few uh, articles. So um, that's okay. He'll come back online here. Let's. Uh, can everyone hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yep. You're yeah, starting, yes. to, break, you're starting okay. to break up a little bit, but you're okay. All right. Well, let's let me first start by uh, asking Ron a question, and then you can use this. You can use this uh, really kind of awful question as just a bad to show some of your photos. But actually, this is sort of a serious question. Uh, I, you know, we've seen space photos our whole lives, all being like, you know, space nuts. But there's something about your photos where they're quite artistic. Right? There's something else happening here. Because, you know, everyone goes up there and they take these sort of standard photos and you cool as space and it's inspiring and stuff. But there's something else about your photos. I don't know if it's the, the composition or the subject matter or what it is about you. Um, but have you thought about this ar artistic side or why are your photos so different and so, so interesting? Well, one, one of the things, you know, people ask me if I had any surprises on my space flight. And I think um, one of the big surprises was how much I enjoyed taking still, uh, still photos. <laughs> and I, I've always been kind of a video guy, and I imagined that I was going to take, you know, all these videos and, and tell the story that way. But when I, you know, we've got these amazing cameras up there. We've got D3S and the D2XS. And uh, on my first flight, we didn't have those cameras. And I think that's why I kind of assumed I'd be a video guy. Um, but when I start, first started taking these pictures and I saw how, how well they captured the view, because it's, it's very frustrating to look out the window and see this amazing sight uh, and not be able to share it. And for the first time, um, I was able to, to share this. Um, to sh you know, I took the picture and say, wow, that's really what it looks like. That, that camera did a really good job of capturing that. And so I got really excited about that and I, I completely shifted gears and, and became a a still photographer versus a you know a videographer, and um, when when I saw how well the cameras captured um, the image, um, then I started to try and catch the emotion of uh, what I was seeing. And um, you know I, what I definitely didn't want to do is be a satellite, you know, a satellite uh, imagery. <laughs> you know, just be a. You know, we have humans up there to share the experience, and so. Um, you know, when we saw, you know, certain shadows being cast on the horizon by, by the thunderstorms, you know, as the sun was setting, and, you know, you feel, a, you know, that's an emotional thing to see. And so, really, all I did was, you know, point these amazing cameras out the window and try and capture what I was feeling. And um, mo most of the, most of, the, of, I think, what, um, for me, made, made, put emotion in the picture was the horizon and get, making sure that the horizon was in the view and not just uh, you know s straight on necessarily, but in in such an angle that it that it gave you the impression that you weren't looking down at the earth, you were looking at a, at a planet hanging in the blackness of space. A little sli a little slice of it because we're not far enough out to see the whole round earth, but uh, you know a, a little a little piece, a little slice of the earth, but to definitely give you that feeling that there's a universe behind it, and it's just floating in the middle of the universe. So that, that was the objective. Um, and the other, you know, the, the really big thing is, you know, we took so many pictures that, you know, okay, if you, I think I took over 25,000 pictures um, during my five and a half months on this mission, and when you take that many pictures, uh, eventually, occasionally, you get it right. So um, some of the pictures turned out all right. Yeah, turned out right. That's a little bit of an understatement. <laughs> We're, we're all in shock. You're just listening to talk, Ron. It took a little bit to register that line. Hey, Ron, can I ask you a question about taking photos through windows? Sure. I mean, I think probably all of us here and everyone watching is taking photos through windows. There's some fantastic views uh, on the top of big buildings and things. Not quite as good as the view you have at the ISS, but um, <laughs> the big challenge that we have is that there's all these reflections, internal lights. You've got this you know, single or double pane of glass. Now... According to my NASA Space Shuffle manual, I think your, uh, your windows might be triple glazed and each, each pane is half an inch thick. It must be an absolute... ...steady, whereas the, the, the lights close to you will have the blur to it, and it actually gives a nice effect to the picture because it shows, shows the motion a little bit. And then when you, when you time lapse that, it all evens out, so... Um, you know, you see, you see the steady lights all of a sudden start to streak out, and that, that, that again, is a really kind of cool effect. 
Yeah, Ron, I was wondering kind of the same thing, how how you tested all these shots, because I'm sitting there on my tripod, I'm looking at my camera, and i got to take hundreds of photos to get this exposure just right so there's not enough streaks in the Milky Way and vice versa, and I'm wondering how, how you're controlling that and how many takes it took you to figure out this right exposure time, because I'm assuming the video f that we're seeing that you did, I'm sure that had to have taken, what, dozens of tries at least, right? Yeah, it, it's um, it's just trial and error, and the thing about it is all the time lapse that you see. Uh, mm -hmm. I know that all the all the ones that I took and all the ones that Mike Fawson took. I don't know if the guys on board now are the same way. All of those are in manual setting, and and the reason for that is is when you put it on automatic, it would change too much, and it would really give a bad effect to the to the time lapse. And so we would basically just take you know take a couple of practice shots, that, get it to the way we we liked it, and then just start. You know, cranking them out like either every once every second, once every three seconds. Um, but you you, ha you get what you get at that point, and uh, they actually they worked out pretty good. And um, even when the sun starts to rise and it changes, you know, the whole exposure change, it actually gives a good effect because it you know you you do get this blossoming, and it's a it, you know they're terrible pictures, but from a video point of view, it's pretty spectacular as the sun comes up and then you you see this sun bloom. And what I would do is I'd quit, you know I'd stop it you know, reset the camera on a different, obviously a different manual setting and then start taking them again and it seemed to work out. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm. Seemed to work out. That's an understatement. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, oh, man. Ron, when, well, you, when, when you go on a holiday to somewhere like, say, you know, if I was to go to the Grand Canyon, I'd come home and it would be a big trip. I'd come home and I'd go, oh, no, I wish I'd done that. I wish I'd remembered to do that. Do you have any feelings like that where you thought you came back down to earth and you were like, oh man, there was that one shot I really wanted to get and I didn't nail it. Maybe it was a time lapse, maybe it was a specific country or, or maybe, you know, sometimes you, you forget you have a certain lens with you and you thought, oh, that would have been, I wish I'd got the picture of that yeah. lake with that lens. Do you, do you have any regrets like that? As far as I know, I haven't taken a picture of Mount Everest. Um, so I was trying to do that. Uh, the Great Wall, I didn't get a picture of that. Uh, but what, what I really kind of um, am sorry about is they were, it was probably a month before I was set to return to Earth when I, when I figured out the time-lapse stuff. You know, we, we got a, um, a message from the ground suggesting that we do the time-lapse. We, we had all been taught how to do it, but I never really um, attempted it because I thought it was going to be too hard. But, but it really was, honestly, very, very easy to do. Once you, you got the, the camera settings correct, you know, it was... It was fairly simple to do, and then we had some really simple um, software with a push of a button. We'd stitch it together into a, a video, and it was it was kind of amazing. The first um, night, uh, you know, it was after bedtime, and I tried this, and I, I downloaded it into my computer, and I was just amazed. And actually, the first <laughs> one I ever did, um, I used, and I don't know if you guys have seen it, but I put together this um, time lapse to Peter Gabriel's Down to Earth, and the opening scene of that is the, the first attempt that I ever did on a time lapse. And so, you know, here I am in my crew quarters. I'm supposed to be asleep about three hours before I get this thing down and I get all excited and then I see the little button that says set to music. So, so I set it to music and then as soon as everybody woke up the next morning, I pulled everybody to a computer and said, hey guys, you got to see this. This is just amazing. And uh, those and the, the crew member, like Mike Fossum and the guys on board now, uh, Don Pettit and Dan Burbank, you know, they've, they've definitely taken it to the next level and um, really perfected uh, some of it because, again, we, you know, we didn't realize how, how simple it was to do that, to, to get it really good uh, right off the bat uh, images and, and stitch them together in this time lapse. And, and, again, what it does really well is tell the story and, and capture the emotion. You know, when you put, when you put motion into, the, into the, the equation, and especially this low-light type of photography, you know, that, that for the first time was, was like, okay, I thought you were actually going to take us with you, but <laughs> I heard that. My, my apologies. What, what would you do differently this time? Uh, I would take a lot more uh, time lapse. I would, I would be doing a lot more bracketing, so I could mm -hmm. do some HDR stuff. Um, um, I guess that, that yeah. you know, there's, a, there's, I mean, you guys know better than I do, but there's a lot of ways you can take pictures that, that will lend themselves to, to post-processing. Um, which I didn't do because uh, I w really wasn't aware of that. Um, so there's, uh, I think things like that. I would experiment a lot more with uh, um, you know, 
bracketing techniques and things like that. Because it is really tough. It's really tough in space to get the right exposure. Jim, you look like you had a question <laughs> earlier. Jim, you're muted. <laughs> Still can't hear you. Do they want to read lips? Jim, did you mute yourself or something in the Hangout? The little microphone on top, is it red? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I just... Uh, well, it looks is, like you should... Yeah, you yeah, should. Just, yeah, tell us about this photo. Well, this is... Um, it was just, just this little sliver of the, of the moon um, that was illuminated. Gosh. And, it, and wow. just as the sun was setting, um, mm. the moon was setting, and so I got, it was in a really good place at the right time, and um, I got the, this is one of my f favorite shots because um, it, it really captures a lot of different effects, and um, you know it gives you the, you, you know, you know, just by looking at the picture, you know where the sun is, and it just kind of puts everything in perspective: the sun, the moon, the earth, um, and the sunset. So it's one of the ones I kind of like. I love those Earthshine shots. Nice. I've got. So I I don't show any pictures now. It's just it's like oh I I had an Earthshine one, but I'm just going to bother now. I love that you're doing this on your free time in between tasks. I mean that's amazing. Yeah. Now you guys who are all doing your time lapse and stuff at night. Do you not find like when I whenever I go out and do some astro shots, I'm shot the next day. I mean I'm so tired because I've been up all night. Well, I'm not even worried that you know. I'm not supposed minutes. to be sleeping, you know, mm -hmm. and for ready for his mission. He's out taking photos all night. He goes, hey guys, look at these awesome pictures I got last night. Well, oh, what <laughs> you do again? Do you, do you yeah, <laughs> it didn't Gordon, compromise the mission, did it, Rob? No, Gordon. We get 16 nights a day, so you know we we, we could be taking night shots <laughs> at, as we're eating lunch. So. <laughs> oh wow. Hey, yeah. Uh, how That's how it. long are those night periods as you're r rotating around? Mm. Uh. Well, well, normally 45 minutes of light, 45 minutes of daytime, but, but it depends on the time of year. And so usually we're in a lot more periods of light than we are of daytime. And there's periods during the orbit where it, it just doesn't work. Um, when we're in the sunshine and the Earth is in the darkness, you can't take pictures of the Earth. It, it just doesn't work. So there's a, there's a lot of timing that goes into it. Um, I think I got another picture I wanted to show you. This, um, let's see, can you guys see this one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, what I like about this one is because um, to me this kind of shows the orbital perspective in that this is a picture of Afghanistan, and it was a picture I took of Afghanistan when you know there was some pretty significant fighting going on on the ground. And if you look at this picture, it looks so peaceful and beautiful. And if you think you know just below those clouds, you know there's we're we're squabbling over you know things that just don't seem that important when you're in space and. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, again, this is this is what I really like about this one. And again, y you know, you have the the shadows on the on the thunderstorms down there, and the, and the, you can see the pink as the as the sun is starting to set. And it's uh, and again, you can get the perspective of where the sun is, where the Earth is, and the moon. And I w you know, the only thing that I wish that was in this picture were the stars, um, which you really can't see even um, when the sun is up. Well, hey, yeah, uh, guys. I I don't know if Jim is your is your uh, mic working yet. No, I don't think he's working right okay. now. Okay, he's he's typed a couple of questions, or he's typed a question in the uh, the chat window here. So, I uh, got a question for Ron on how the cameras were mounted in microgravity. Um, well, we would either hold them in our hands, or we had these brackets that we call them bogan arms uh, that would clamp onto a, a part of the space station, and then we could just move them anywhere. You know, any different orientation that we wanted and they held the cameras uh, very still. Did you try any like lens, like while well, they sell like a lens skirt that you put, put up against the window to keep the glare off? Yes, or? we did. We did the, um, mm. Spatial Endeavor brought one up and we stole it from them. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> Ron, do you have, can you recharge batteries on the ISS or did you bring up just a ton of batteries with you? No, we, we recharge them, um, and we go through them pretty fast, especially when we do the, the time-lapse stuff, you know, because we're taking four or 500 shots at a time, and it, it burns the batteries, you know, burns through them pretty and fast. But we, we have chargers. Again, whoever's like the commander of the ISS at that moment, and they're monitoring the amount of electricity that's being used, they're like, 
Who's been recharging their camera again? <laughs> it's all solar energy. We have more solar energy than we, than we can use. So it's great. That's right. So, Ron, I can't imagine the uh, the feeling that you get when you're all the way up there. And just like you talked about the shot f uh, of Afghanistan, how, and, and I, I think you're doing stuff with Fragile Oasis with this, but, I mean, I can't imagine that feeling, and maybe you can talk a little bit about it, of seeing this fragile oasis below you and there being so much conflict and so many problems that we're facing and now this global warming. I mean, how, how do you react to that? Yeah, I mean, it's a sobering contradiction. It, it really um, affects you um, when you see how peaceful and beautiful and fragile the planet is. And um, it, it really does, like I said, make everything that we fight over seem so insignificant. And, um, and you know, some of the inequity that's on our planet, it just seems so much worse from that vantage point. Um, yeah. And, you know, it, it kind of filled me with a, a call to action, you know, to kind of make, make a difference. And I think that, that we all can. I mean, um, and so there's a lot of projects that we're working on right now to, to try and make a difference. Uh, and the secret, I think, is, is, you know, being able to work together uh, and, and to kind of team up to tackle these problems. And I think that's, you know, part of the legacy of the space program. We have 15 nations that came together and built the International Space Station, some of which we're not always the best of friends, and that that is probably one of the greatest engineering accomplishments of all time. And you know, if we can do that by working together, imagine what we can do to solve a lot of the problems facing the planet. And so, you know, I, I think that's you know, something that we get from the space program. We also get the uh, the idea or the fact that nothing is nothing is impossible. You know, if we can go to the moon and back, if we can build a space station, anything is impossible. And then we get this orbital perspective. And now that we have these new cameras, and the cameras are getting be better all the time, as you guys know. Um, you know, we can share it better, and I think, you know, it, the more emotion that we can put in the pictures, the more we could, emotion that we could put into the um, time-lapse photography, and by emotion I mean being able to really uh, share the experience, I think the better off we're all going to be, because I think we get, uh, uh, on some level, uh, and maybe even a deeper level than we had before, this feeling that, you know, we're all, each one of us is riding through the universe together on the spaceship we call Earth, and and we really get that feeling. When you're looking down at the Earth, you really get that feeling. It's, it's very sobering. I can't imagine. Trey, are you back with us? Yeah, but I, my connection is so sketchy, y'all. I apologize. And I'm really enjoying uh, listening to this. Uh, I, I want to see uh, uh, also everyone else's uh, photos. Yeah, as well. I, I wanted to be on the show so I could learn stuff from you guys. So, <laughs> I, I, was told, I was told you were all going to tell your secrets. <laughs> <laughs> How much time you got? <laughs> well, let's start left and right, shall we? Um, shall we start with Ben and have a look at uh, some of your pictures and um, <laughs> a bit about them? you got to be kidding me, man. I mean, what, <laughs> Ron, what you've done in your free time on the space station is so <laughs> incredible. Uh, to, to put any picture up in this conversation just feels ridiculous, but... Um, <laughs> Sure. Yeah, hey, why not? Let's start the ball off with the guy who takes pictures of the roar from the space station. <laughs> it's, a bit, it's a bit like being at a party and you're trying to chat up a girl or something, some guy comes along and goes, hey, I'm an astronaut. And you're like, no, I can't go home. What can I do? How do I follow that? No, no, see, that's, I, that's, not re that's not really fair because, I mean, I, I, I was very, very fortunate to be in the place that I was. I wish, I wish we could send more, I wish we could send poets and musicians and, and real photographers and, you know, we have amazing cameras now that are basically point and shoot for the most part. They're really easy to use, as you guys know. And, you know, you guys, if you guys are up there, the pictures would be a thousand times better. So, and I'm not just saying so you that. You guys are doing such a great job at sharing that stuff, though, now, Ron. You know that, you know, in the past year or a couple of years, not only have the imaging, not only has the imaging got better, but the sharing's got better. It's so much more open. You feel like you can engage with NASA and... You know, the pictures that you're taking, are, you know, it's, it's really nice to be able to see those, so hey, well, good job. Can I, can I ask you guys a question? Because this is, this is something that's really difficult on board. You know, you don't have a lot of time. You're taking a lot of pictures, and it's very difficult to keep track of them all. It's very difficult to identify where they are. And when you share them, it's, it's a really, you know, it's really good, you know, whether it's Twitter or Google Plus or, or whatever you're sharing it on, because we have the Internet up there. Um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to create an open source um, uh, you know, repository of pictures uh, where we could dump all these pictures and, and have, you know, some crowdsourcing on them where people can take them, they could, they could post-process them, 
they can identify them, they can categorize them, and um, then we would be able to use them, you know, near real, real time while the guys are on board. So as, the, as they downlink the pictures, we can send them to two places. We can send them to NASA, but at the same time we can send them to, you know, whatever this repository is, which would be open to the public or maybe to maybe select people in the public however we want to work it, where we could, we could start, um, you know, basically having people come along as fellow crew members on the mission. What, what do you guys think about that? Is that feasible, or is that something that you think would be worthwhile? I think it's a killer idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Heck, I'd process your images. Try to use them for his homework assignments. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, I think any of us would want to process your images and and help distribute those. You know, it's just the plan of it's just getting it together and getting an email address is what I think. And that way, I mean, I think you guys have enough to worry about up there. But if you were able to send it to one of us, I mean, especially Trey with all of his followers, I'm sure that people that uh, follow him would love to see those kinds of pictures. So, so then we could, you know, we could s the pictures would come down. And then when, when you guys get a picture that you really like, you've identified it, you've post-processed it, it's, it becomes this masterpiece, then we send it back, we e email it back up, and then the astronaut on board can, can send it out through social media and identify those people who, who did, did the hard work on it mm -hmm. and, uh, and really, you know, start sharing them that way. That'd be awesome. Mm, it's, a great, it's a great idea. And also, even if we could get involved in the, hey, guys, could you take a picture of this? I don't know if there's any opportunity to do that. You know, if we could sometimes maybe even have some input into some of the subjects or timings or things. Then, you know, leave, leave you guys to do the really complex stuff. You can offload the, uh, some of the compositions or subjects. We can suggest some of those if that makes it easier. Yeah. We've upset Ron so much he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Unless he's gone, he's gone to implement it already. That is that. <laughs> <laughs> Ben, here's your chance. He's no, no, it seems like share a good chance to start sharing uh, share, photos. Share those photos right now. Oh, uh, all right. Let's turn the left. Um, let's see here. Actually, guys, I just got back from a uh, weekend in the mountains um, and was part of uh, a group of friends. We made the first igloo ever that I've ever worked. Oh, that doesn't look so good on the screen, does it? It's not bad. Not so bad. It so it's good. not a great shot, but literally just pulled it off the card and... Um, put it up online. So we made that igloo this weekend, and there's stars above it. I had like an hour of clear skies. Um, but something more along, what I like to do uh, is kind of, uh, here's another weekend out. Uh, this was last year, kind of uh, stars and mountain and, and tent. So. Um, and then one it's more. Um, Ron, this one's, this one's, I kind of feel like you might like it. Uh, it's it's not space, but uh, I really think I really appreciate the effort you go to to find interesting viewpoints and kind of connection with story and stuff. Yeah, that's a, that is that's amazing. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I uh, kind of went to great lengths to try to find a, a context that can sort of put the stars off in a new way. So uh, I'm, I'm loving these old houses wow. with the stars. Yeah, I love that. Mm -hmm. That is awesome. Thanks, but so just you, saying, I really appreciate all the effort there? you go to. What's that? Did, did you put a light inside there, Ben? Was it abandoned and you put a light inside? Yep, it's abandoned. Uh, there's a couple lights, uh, lanterns, headlamps, all battery powered, so no fire hazard. Uh, but funny story, around 4 a.m. I went in there to get the lights out, and there was a giant porcupine in there. <laughs> I almost like literally tripped on, and that thing freaked me out. I was so scared, like I couldn't even scream. It was one of those like silent screams. It was just like <laughs> I just like slowly went freaking out out of the house. So something always interesting happens in those abandoned houses. Yeah. That is the worst thing about astrophotography, the scary sounds at night. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. The animals. No one, no one warns you about the scary sounds. Go out and take some pictures at night. <laughs> I, I think I, I have that in a disclaimer. <laughs> 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 so I, I have no qualms being a tough guy me. going out at night shooting. I get scared all the time. <laughs> 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 but, uh, hey, real quick before I pass the ball... Uh, Ron, I got a text from a really uh, heavy time-lapse shooter, Jay Bur Burlidge, and he said he'd love to post-process your space station shots anytime. Cool. So cool. I think the yeah. collective photo body uh, <laughs> would be honored to be involved in that kind of concept in any way. All right, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and set something up, and if you guys have any ideas along that, that, uh, that route, let me know, because um, we're, we're, I think we're going to try and do that. That would be cool.
That'd be great. We'd love to help out. Hey, Brad, should we, should we hand, it, hand it over to you now? I okay. have to say, you, got, you nailed some of the best Lunar Eclipse photos. That oh, thank year. you. That, that was... Uh, uh, I'm not Thank sure you. That, you know if you got the moon rolling down the mountainside. Yeah. Uh, just everything was everything came together. I I can beautiful. pull that one up real quick. Give me a second. Well, let me let me start with this one. This was probably my uh, wait. Where's the screen share? Do you see that? Yeah. yeah okay. So nice this is probably song. the most like f I don't know popular one or whatever out on the web. Um, this was NASA's astronomy picture of the day taken in uh, Arches National Park. Uh, this is double arch, and um, you know, like you said about the eclipse, you know, it just takes hours and hours of planning these shots. Um, definitely not something I do in my downtime, Ron. And uh, it, <laughs> you know, I mean, to to plan this Milky Way, to put that right right up against the arch, um, to have that clear night sometime in May, which was kind of rare, but you know, it it just all works out. And then the the distant monoliths in the background of the image too was just something that all worked out really well and um, one thing with this image in particular you have to uh, fight with is light pollution and you know Arches National Park that used to be one of the darkest places in the world but uh, Moab you know Arches is getting more popular and you got Canyonlands next to that with a whole bunch of other uh, national parks and uh, Moab's growing, therefore light pollution is growing. So, who who actually knows how long these kinds of uh, dark skies will be uh, in the Arches National Park? It's kind of kind of scary. Uh, so, Brad, are you illuminating that with hand lights, or is that kind of? A, uh, yes, I am. That that was a uh, light painting, and uh, another light painting one that I'll show here. Uh, this was during the Orionids meteor shower. Yeah. Beautiful. And um, this is a composite. Wow. I don't know how well you can see those meteors at the top, but um, it, this was probably the most difficult, scariest shot I've ever had to do. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever shot very close to waterfalls. It's not very fun. Uh, wow. It's slippery, <laughs> dangerous, all the above. But what was good is I didn't have creepy sounds to uh, freak me out <laughs> in the middle of the night because it was so loud. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it was really cool. But yeah, this was a composite. This is not a single frame, which most people think. Um, so basically just took a bunch of shots throughout the night. And I wish I could have turned it into a time-lapse video, but there were so many breaks in the, in the shooting because I had to wipe the lens off because of all the spray that was coming from the falls. Hey, you hey, shone a light on the fall, on the, on the fall then, did you, for that? Yes, yes. Absolutely. Uh, that, I mean, that for way, anyone who's you know, not done this before, I mean, it's how, like how long a, are you doing that for? How long are you doing that for, typically? I mean, is it just a little little burst? Yeah, I, I wish I could tell you. You you really, you need to play with it. I mean, it, 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 it depends on how much ISO you're using. It depends on what your aperture is. Um, it, it all depends on the exposure, because sometimes you do it too much, and then it gets too bright, and uh, vice versa. Um, I'd say a good start was maybe only like five seconds for a twenty-second exposure. Hey, hey, Brad, let me let me say something. To, 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 kind of let me start. say something to, yeah. put some, to put something in perspective because I think you brought out a really good point in that you know you guys uh, the perspective that you have is that you you think of a shot, you plan it, it takes hours to plan it, you have to have everything perfect, and you get the shot. Whereas where we are, the environment that we're in, we we have amazing shots presented to us, handed to us on a silver platter every second. And all we have to do is snap the picture. And I could, I could give you, a, here's a, let me uh, share one of these with you real quick, because this is a perfect example of being at the oh. right place at the right time. So, How? so I mean, this is, this is digitally blown up, but, you know, the, the stuff like this happens all the time, you know, where you have the auroras and you have the city lights and everything else, and all we have to do is just stick a camera there and capture it. So it's, you guys, you know, are, you're doing it a lot harder than it is for us because we have these things handed to us by the second. Yeah, I appreciate that, yeah. Um, and I'm sure any one of these guys can testify to that. I mean, it, it just takes so much timing. Because, um, you know, it's it's kind of like, I mean, imagine a photographer going out to a lake and waiting for that perfect sunset, you know. And something like that, it can happen. Of them every day. 
<laughs> I love saying that, don't you? <laughs> oh, that's great. But I mean, imagine you know you you got kind of one big subject to work with. Whereas what we're trying to do is we're trying to put that big subject together with another subject that is just so far away, and we're trying to align that with something else. I mean, it, you're right, and a lot of people I. Sometimes they get it, but sometimes they don't. And, I mean, it's it's hard for me to answer all the questions that I get when I get emails of people um, just asking, how do I shoot like that? And it's hard for me because I, I wish I could teach you, but it'd probably take, you know, six hours or so. <laughs> um, I don't know if you can see the shot that's on my screen now. Yes, we uh, can. This one. This one I, I did for uh, the uh, gallery in Mount Shasta for uh, an opening I had. And... To find this spot um, to shoot the Milky Way with Mount Shasta in the foreground, I, I don't own a four-wheel drive vehicle, which I really need to invest in, but I actually got stuck up on the mountain um, just trying to scout and find a location because, you know, in these forests, th there's so many trees that uh, there aren't too many openings to have a clear view of the night sky. So once I did find this, it just happened to be that perfect time of year, and... Um, it's interesting too, there's a lot of uh, haze in the bottom of the image where there was a forest fire going on uh, near the Mount Hood area. And that that's another kind of thing that we always have to work with is just Mother Nature and what she's producing too. That's awesome. Cool. So, so, yeah. Hey, Dave, Dave, may I uh, ask, do we, have to, do we only have five minutes left on this show or do we keep going? Um, I said we keep going because yeah. we, we, everybody cool. needs to show their shots. So, and Jim, you're oh, right. I think work. I think it's okay, good. Brad. If you, um, I think we should ha uh, just check if Jim's mic's working because he's not said anything to us this evening. Jim, Jim, are you yeah, there? I've, I've been trying. If, trust me. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> we can hear there we you. Go. Yay! I don't know why. I love your book, book, by the way, Jim. I, I bought I bought your book. It's fabulous. Thank you very much. I actually had a, another question uh, for, for Ron there, which was, have you? I know that. Uh, being a scientist and being an astronaut and being out there, it's fantastic to capture things as they appear. But one of the things I've always wondered uh, is more of the abstraction of the subject. So, for example, standing in the middle of the desert while I'm doing night photography, I'm thinking, what would it be like to be a satellite spinning in space and taking a long exposure? What, what would space look like at that point, and how weird would that look? So I was wondering uh, if, if you go out there next time or maybe... I, I missed it in some of your, your photo stream. Are you taking any abstractions of what you're seeing, like a long exposure and complete orbit? Um, I, I have not done that. I think Don Pettit, who's on board right now, does some of that. Um, but no, and, and certainly if I had the opportunity to go again, I'd be doing a lot of different experimentation. Seeing, again, because you know, you're trying to capture the experience and the emotion of being there um, yeah. and share it. Well, I would imagine... Uh, part of being an astronaut is being back on Earth and kicking yourself with, why didn't I think of doing that right, right. <laughs> at some point? Right. Hey, Jim, since you're on and your connection's working with us, do you want to take this opportunity to share some of your photos? <laughs> Assuming it still works, I'm more than happy to. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, screen share. Is that working? Yep. Yeah. Yep. It's sure Beauty. Is. Okay. Yeah, this one is, uh, just because it's randomly taken, this one is uh, on the, the racetrack in Death Valley, and there's still some light pollution there, but it's still not as bad as in other areas within California. And so this is a multi-image stitch of uh, the Milky Way arcing across the, the sky. Um, <clears throat> I actually had more in the scene... Um, but stitching software is still uh, tricky and limited, so I'll, I'll rework this at some point and include Jupiter in the upper right-hand corner. How many exposures is that? Uh, you know, I don't remember offhand, but it's probably... I, I think I overkilled this, and I, I had probably like 14 or 16, and I ended up uh, omitting maybe half of them. So I think it's about seven or eight images, and they're, uh, they're vertical images. That looks fantastic. Mm -hmm. oh, thanks. That's good. Um, so we were talking about abstraction. 
Um, so th this one is mm. uh, taken with a Canon 8 to 15 millimeter uh, lens that I got from borrowlenses.com, and uh, they were kind enough to give it to me. So the light streak at the top is actually a car driving by, <laughs> <laughs> and that's on one side of the valley. And then uh, towards the bottom, uh, the highlights here uh, is actually uh, the starlight shining off the desert floor. And basically this is a uh, 100% view of <laughs> of the night sky. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I, I was so is that, is, is that a number of exposures that you stacked, or is that a single exposure? Yeah, no, that is. I, I just set this up and let it run until my battery died. Um, so I, I think it ended up capturing about three, three and a half hours wow. of the night sky. I, I'd have to double check, but I think that's about right. And uh, yeah, I, I've had a lot of people comment to me that this looks like a thumbprint. <laughs> Which I don't think is that far off, because I think at different places within uh, different places on Earth and at different seasons, you would get very unique uh, signature of star trails. So it's not that far off. Uh, let's see. So Jim, just while you're queuing up your next picture, you say that's about a three-hour exposure. Um, could, could I ask what ISO and what F number you're using for that? Because that's a pretty dark sky not to blow out over that length of time. Well, it, I mean, it is pitch black. I, I'm doing this when there's no moon in the sky. Um, let's wow. see here. I'd have to remember exactly what it is. Let's see. No, I don't have it on this one because it's composite, but I have a feeling I was... It's no less than ISO 1600, and it's more likely going to be uh, ISO 3200 is what I'm thinking based on my memory of it. And is, is the next one showing up for you guys? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Yep. yep. Yeah, so um, this one again, I can't remember the principle, but it's basically this concept that uh, really if the sky is full of infinitely of stars, then wouldn't the sky be white? Um, and I, I think that our eyes don't adjust to it, but your cameras can. Um, and so this actually I just set up outside of my tent and let it run while I was asleep. <clears throat> and, that doesn't uh, count then. <laughs> What's that? I said it doesn't count then. It doesn't count. What are you talking you about? Can't be sleep. You can't be sleep. It was freezing. Yeah. I had to stay warm. Um, yeah, but uh, for the most part, this is um, uh, kind of, uh, they call it ecliptical star trails, you can actually see the ecliptic plane, which is where the, the star plane is uh, a straight line, and it just so happened at this time of year, even as far north as California where I was, you can still see the bending in the stars uh, at each pole. Uh, it's one of those things I wish the, I, could, <laughs> I could have the, the widest lens that I, that would have worked for this, it still did, I think this was at like 16 millimeters or something like that, so just shy of being in a fish eye. Um, I thought it came out pretty good. Very, I, I like the artistic nature of it. A lot of people feel that the star trails are too overpowering, but again, if you think about it, uh, all those stars are out there. Technically, the sky could be white if your if your vision was sensitive enough. Uh, how quickly are the images uh, refreshing? Right away. Very quick. That looks okay. great. Great. Yeah. So this one's Mobius Arch uh, in the Alabama Hills, Alabama Hills, and. Um, most people shoot the opposite direction on this one. They shoot Mount Whitney and, and whatnot. And I decided to set up for about seven hours. And I was awake during this one. <laughs> I was sitting in the middle of the <laughs> dark uh, waiting for this to, to go through. And this was hundreds of 30-second exposures. Um, and I kind of blended it with a, a sunset shot. So that gives it a little bit more of the, uh, the glow on the rocks and the, the color in the sky. Love the abstract nature of that one. Yeah, thank you. And uh, this, again, is the racetrack, but actually I'll, I'll mess with this one. I've always wanted to do a reflection shot oh, cool. of Star wow. Trails. And I kind of, the, the wind picked up, uh, so the, the reflections kind of washed out, unfortunately. So th there's a little bit of Photoshop magic here uh, with the Star Trails, but I still think that it has a great impact, and somewhere out there there's a reflection that's waiting for me to to get in camera. I wanted to ask all, all of you guys, um, 
the thing, one of the things I really love about your, your Star Trail shots and all the ones that, that you show is that you really integrate the landscape into them beautifully. I'm just so unimaginative, I point the camera straight up. I don't even try and integrate anything else. And there's such an, it, they, they look so fantastic when you, when you get like those arches or, or even, you know, a man-made building, you know, with a clips perched on the top. I wonder, do you use any software that actually tells you when is a good time for, a, you know, an astronomical object to be in a certain place at a certain time of year? Or is, it, is most of it just part look? I, I use Stellarium quite a bit to figure out where the Milky Way is going to be in the moon and, on the, you know, a certain day or night, or a certain night. Yeah. I, um, I use a, a really good app I just discovered. Um, it's called Starwalk. It's only $2.99 for iPhones from iTunes, uh, iTunes App Store. And then there's also a good app called Star Map. Uh, that one I believe is either 9.99 or 10.99, and a whole lot of Google Earth. Yeah, yeah. I, I wrote a blog post on night apps that I use, and the ones that uh, have been the most useful to me have been um, Go Skywatch, because that one has actually got uh, an augmented reality thing where you can actually point your your phone in the sky mm. and actually identify objects. And I, I do plan, and the foreground elements are extremely important. Um, even for Ron, you know, you, you have to get some kind of foreground element to give you some kind of bearing as to where you are. Otherwise, I think it's too disorienting for people that aren't, that haven't been able to experience that moment. Um, and I think it also adds a certain degree of drama. Uh, TPE is a good one. Uh, the photographer's ephemeris. Um, Jim, what was the first one you said? Uh, Go Skywatch. And that, that one's really cool. I don't know that it would work too well in space, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but on hey Earth, Jim. It's awesome. Jim, I just you know your 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 photos are, are tremendously artistic, but I think there's there's probably a scientific value, if not if not scientific, an educational value. I, I think. I mean that that would be those would be really good pictures to use in an astronomy class to show, like you said, the ecliptic uh, and the mo and the relative motion of the stars, and and be able to translate that to the motion of the Earth and that's that is really amazing. Oh, thank you. I'm I'm honored that you you like them so much. One of the themes that's coming through on all, all these pictures, and obviously, if you're into astrophotography, that getting dark skies is really important. I wanted to ask all of you. Maybe don't give away your true secret locations, but if somebody, let's just do North America at the moment, because that's where most of you guys are. Whereabouts in North America is the best dark sky for you? Um, we'll start with Ben. Where's where's a great location if people want to go somewhere truly truly dark? Uh, I, I, I try to let people know that I usually drive two to four hours outside the city to get the star shots. And uh, out here in Oregon, we're really lucky that once you go outside that radius, it's really wide open. Uh, but if I can make a trip out to southeast Oregon, that's like heaven for me. I mean, it's, it's wide open, it's low light pollution, it's glorious. So that's my spot. How about you, Brad? Pick me up on the way, Ben. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah you just moved out here recently, right? <laughs> Uh, for me, you know, it, that's a that's an interesting question. I um I, you know, I, on the PCT, I went through all kinds of different terrains, and um, even when I was up in the middle of the Sierras, uh, up at like 10,000 feet, 100 and something miles away, I could still see Fresno in the distance, and that giving off light pollution. Um, so for for me, I've been kind of traveling all around, but you know, Oregon and Northern California have been pretty good to me. Uh, there are also some really great spots in Utah too, but you know, like Ben said, I would recommend anyone just just start driving. Yeah. And when you don't see a single city light somewhere, that's a good start. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and then maybe even drive some more. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I always have this thought in my mind. I wish I could create some kind of dock or plank or something out in the middle of the ocean, so I could be just right in the middle of the countries and not get any kind of light pollution. Um, Ron, you need to work on that with me, okay? <laughs> yeah, you can you can throw stones you, you all got, the You got you got friends who know people. Come on now. <laughs> hey, Daryl, yeah. that's a good dark spot. Um, obviously, uh, northern Ontario. Um, I usually like I've gone fishing up there, found, you know, hundreds of times. Literally, um, I've never actually photographed up there because, like I said, I just started. You know, uh, last summer I started seriously taking photographs. Um, but it's about a 12-hour drive to truly get away into a, what they call a, a zero, you know, light pollution zone. 
Um, good, good time now just to, to do a quick little thing. What we mean by light pollution is if you ever look out, you know, look out your window, on, especially on a cloudy night, you can see it. You'll see kind of a glow on the, uh, the horizon. That's actually what's known as sky glow or, or light pollution. When we talk about a dark sky, we're talking about where you have zero light pollution, um, zero light from the moon. So that's, you know, if, if you're looking to, to see the Milky Way, if you get to an area that's actually a true dark sky location, um, there are people that have mistaken the Milky Way for uh, dawn. You know, that's how bright the stars get. Um, but just to let everybody know, um, this was actually pointed out to me by a fellow G pluser. Um, there is a map overlay for Google Earth that will actually, it's a, a light pollution map. What? So you can actually find, I, I haven't used it myself, but I've yet to find it. Um, but what I'll do in the, the next little while, especially I've got everybody here in my circles, um, so I'll, uh, when, when I find out exactly, I'm going to talk to the guy that I talked to about it. Uh, it's an overlay for Google, you know, kind of like a plug-in, and it will actually show you a light pollution chart so you can, and it goes by different grades. Is there a guy chime in on that? Yeah, go ahead. If you do a Google search for dark sky finder, it'll yeah. bring up a website, and it has that uh, light pollution Google map overlay. There you go. So not Perfect. not the website, but just Google that dark sky finder, and that'll bring it to you. Perfect. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think that, that, that was mm -hmm. based on census, correct? Is that is that like a population density thing? I, I think it was. Well, I mean, kind of it, the formula, I think, makes sense, but I think that was what it was for. Okay. But in any case, it's a great start, absolutely. Yeah. And if any, all these apps and stuff that you guys are mentioning, it'd be great if you could put them on the stream so that people can find them. I'm just talking about me selfishly here. Jim, I noticed you nodded <laughs> when uh, people were talking about Utah as a dark location. Isn't uh, Bryce Canyon, well, that's not, is that, I'm not even going to show my state ignorance, but isn't Bryce supposed to be one of the darkest places? They have, they've got a sign saying it's really dark here, I think. Yeah, I, I think um, the southern portion of the state is considered one of the darkest, uh, you know, uh, the areas with the least amount of light pollution uh, in the country. Uh, I, I wish Death Valley was as dark. That's a little closer to me, but it's an amazing place to be. I think um, it was kind of made subtly earlier in one of the comments, but I think it's really misleading to people um, how much light is actually naturally there in the in the sky. I, I don't people just can't believe it, and it's really unfortunate that there's so much uh, light pollution. People just don't realize that the ambient lights of just their their homes can create so much pollution in the sky. I actually just to plug a, an organization that's used some of my images in the past, uh, the International Dark Sky Association. They're actually yeah. out there trying to um, preserve and educate people to, you know, the importance of having a dark sky. It seems kind of something you take for granted, but uh, once you realize what's there, you, you realize how much you're missing. Yeah. So, Randy, what, what about you? Is it, and also, anybody who lives in a city and is now feeling disheartened that they can't, disheartened? I just made that word up. <laughs> disheartened that they can't go out and do any long exposure stuff because they live somewhere with a bright sky. There are ways around this, aren't there? There are light pollution filters. You can use shorter exposures and stack them. But um, Do you want to talk about that and also your favorite dark locations? You know, I've tried shooting where there's some light pollution, but, you know, you, you always end up with that orange glow in the sky, and you, you really can't get rid of it. But I mostly shoot in western South Dakota, but I've shot out in Utah and southwest Colorado is really good, um, Canyon of the, of the Ancients area. And up in Wyoming is really good. Um, you know, you just get as far away from the city lights as you can. Um, you know, within 100 miles or more, you know. So, well, sorry, I shouldn't say 480 millimeter. That's what the uh, focal length is. It's an 80 millimeter F6 uh, apochromatic triplet. Um, this shot here is probably about. Uh, 42 minutes of uh, photography. Uh, it's stacked. Uh, probably each shot is about 180 seconds. Uh, and they're stacked together using a, a free program called uh, a Deep Sky Stacker. Uh, and then you do post processing in uh, Photoshop. But uh, that's the, the type of photography that I originally got into. Uh, I'll show another one here quick. So, Daryl, for the people who this don't is do known this as the seven thing, why sisters. do you do? Yeah. Why do you do lots of individual exposures and stack them instead of one long one? Could you explain that? 
Uh, yeah, the, the, the best way to explain it, um, you want, first of all, you want the ability to, uh, to, to use different uh, exposures. Uh, for on M42, the last one that I showed, uh, if, if you just did one big long exposure, that central part would be absolutely blown out. There would be no detail in it whatsoever. So it allows you to kind of do that. It's almost like an HDR. Um, the other or other main reason that uh, I do it as well is something as small as a gust of wind can ruin your shot. So if you've got, you know, say it uh, 45 minutes into the shot and then all of a sudden a little gust of wind comes up and shakes your, your I have a 20 pound tripod that I use uh, when I do this. So, you know, if something comes up and shakes it, you've, you've lost that amount of time. Or if so some pesky astronaut in the RSS shot. goes past your field of view. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've never had that problem. I think that would be totally cool. <laughs> you do get satellites uh, that fly through every once in a while. Um, again, sometimes uh, if, if they're cool enough, you can leave them in, uh, or you can just edit them out, leave that shot out. Um, this one here that you're looking at is actually uh, uh, the Seven Sisters. It, from from Earth, it looks like a tiny. Uh, you know, looks like a tiny dipper almost. Uh, you'll see it, uh, I guess it would be right now uh, pretty high in the sky when it gets dark, but it looks like a little, uh, that's about, you know, how you'd see it from Earth. Uh, again, this is about 40 minutes of, of photography stacked. Uh, so yes, yeah, that's, that's the, the, the type of, uh, of photography I really enjoy doing. Uh, since joining G+, uh, the likes of the, the guests here have gotten me into... Uh, uh, trying my hand at some of the uh, the landscape or the uh, star trails. Um, this one was actually just taken the other night. I don't know if you can see it here yet. Yep. Yep. There we go. Um, I, I I drive by this area. This is about 10 minutes away from my home. Um, and for those of you that uh, uh, you know that are watching that that talk about light pollution, down in the right hand corner, uh, the the High tension t towers are leading towards that city. Uh, that light that is being produced there is from a city that's probably about 40 miles away. So it, it does affect. Uh, it actually it worked in my benefit in this case because yeah. it lit up the towers. <laughs> um, this is uh, probably about well, those towers is those, those, those towers is is what's making the light. Yeah. It's nice it kind of leads towards the problem, isn't it? <laughs> That's a pretty good yeah. statement right there. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, the, uh, this shot, there's kind of a bit of a funny story to it. I almost, uh, uh, this is a, a whole bunch of, you know, 30 second exposures stitched uh, or put stacked as well. Um, about 45 minutes into shooting this, uh, the Ontario Provincial Police actually came up and uh, I was afraid they were going to shine their lights and blow up my nice black foreground, so I actually started running towards them and then turned on my lights, so <laughs> mm. I had to, uh, had to save this shot, because that's, that's the type of things you deal with when you do long exposures. Mm. Um, if I had have had a break where, you know, I, I couldn't use those frames, you would have had a, a, a break in the star trail, so it basically would have ruined that shot. And this is one of the darker nights that we've had in, in some time, so get another it's funny, I usually hide in the bushes when the cops show up. <laughs> I don't mind. I've got, a, I've got a buddy who's a police officer, so I just, you know, you throw his name out. <laughs> nice. Um, this one doesn't show up all that well. Um, this is a, a, just a pier in a, a little town called uh, Port Dover. Um, this is across uh, Lake Erie. Uh, you, know, I, you know, if I kept going across Lake Erie here, I'd eventually run into, uh, I think it's Ohio. Uh, but this is just, it wasn't a super uh, uh, great night for, for photographing. Uh, one thing that hasn't been mentioned in the Hangout here is, is when you're photographing stars and you want to see more of them, there's actually a few factors. There's, there's uh, you know, obviously the clouds and stuff like that, your light pollution, but there's also something uh, called seeing. And what we mean by that, I don't know if anyone's ever walked outside and looked up at the moon and you've seen, you know, a halo around the moon. Well, that's a bunch of ice crystals. You know, those types of things affect how you uh, see stars or how many stars you see. Um, this shot here could have been a lot better 
uh, had I had a better night for quote unquote C. So, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of factors. It, it, it can be a lot more difficult than, than people think sometimes to, uh, to capture these images. Okay, that's enough for me. <laughs> I will unscreen share. Cool, those are awesome pictures. Now, in, um, in the chat, on the Twitch chat, um, there were some people asking, who, who dropped in and out of it there, what, what kind of instruments you were using. So most of those Deep Sky ones were at prime focus, which is just a complicated word for putting your camera straight on the end of the telescope and straight yeah. on the eyepiece, right? Yeah, um, just to, oh, I can quickly go through it. Um, I've got what they call a German equatorial mount. Uh, yeah, do you have a photo of your setup? Do you have a photo of your telescope with the camera oh, on it? Oh, you know what? I do, actually. Give me a second I love here. the gear shots. Do you love gear shots? No. <laughs> you yeah, guys I go know. ahead and talk. <laughs> you, you guys go ahead and talk, and when I find it, I will... Uh, uh, can I chime, chime in with the website while he's looking? Uh, another one for finding good spots to go shoot at is cleardarksky.com, and there's a whole list of observatories in the U.S., and it has uh, fantastic charts that kind of talk about uh, the transparency of the night, the visibility, the, l the light pollution, and all that other thing. So if you're not sure even where to begin, uh, a good way to begin is looking at these lists of um, observatories that are in your state. And that website is cleardarksky.com. Yeah, mm -hmm. I use that all the time. Yeah. Hey, Ron, you mentioned uh, dark skies in uh, Texas. Check out uh, Big Bend National Park. Big Ben, okay. Yeah, very dark skies there. I shot a few time lapse sequences there, and uh, just plan your plan your trip right. Mine, uh, it was I got the Milky Way rising rising from the horizon, which worked out really cool. But I had to twiddle my thumbs for half the night. <laughs> but really great place to go and go camping too, definitely. Thanks. Wasn't Big Ben just designated as an uh, international dark sky park now? It should be on that list. I don't know. I, I have not heard. Yeah, the uh, the uh, International Dark Sky, Dark Sky Association. They've been working to set aside places uh, for sky viewing, and then they work with the municipalities to kind of control the light pollution in the area, so that lights that are put forward have different um, protection things to to not cause more light pollution. So that's exciting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Yeah, we've got okay, one. Okay, let's hand well. over to Randy. Okay. Let me get up here. Hey, Randy, did you ever get a chance to introduce yourself? No, I didn't. Uh, my mic wasn't working then. Uh, my name is Randy Helverson, and DakotaLapse.com is my website. And I shoot mostly time lapse, but I also get the uh, um, astro photos out of it, too. For, now, for some reason, my windows are closed. Screen sharing can be quite a challenge. Well, yeah, I'm doing. S I got the window open, but I don't see it on the screen share. You usually have to have it open beforehand to then choose it. Maximize it. I have it maximized. Yeah, you have to have it open before you click the screen share button. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Okay, can you see that? Nice. Beauty. Yeah. That's the shooting star that Ron shot from the space station. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, hey, maybe Ron could actually throw things down <laughs> and see if that going to create a few things. Say, Ron, we're ready. Yeah. <laughs> Just throw your memory card down, Ron. I'll take yeah. care of the rest. <laughs> That's actually, it's a meteor I shot last October, and uh, the moon was just a crescent, and it was starting to go down, and then the Milky Way is just to the left of the moon. And uh, it, the meteor hit, and then it it formed a persistent train, which it looks like a smoke trail, but it's actually ionizing gases, and it lasted for about a half an hour through the time lapse. So I caught that uh, whole process. It you know last you know just a few seconds on the time lapse, but it was pretty interesting. Well, that was and uh, it's in my new my new time lapse that I just put out a week ago. Yeah, well, I watched that time lapse. What an amazing uh, sight to see. Mm-hmm. That, yeah, that's that way amazing. better than any science book. That was incredible. Yeah, and you know, I caught one like a, about a week earlier too, but it was a lot shorter and it was right on the edge of the frame. And you know, those are the only two I've caught, but I caught them within a week of each other. That's incredible. How long did it take for uh, the score to be written? Um, it, it only took bare probably uh, maybe 
three or four days, I suppose, to score it. But oh, he really? was bu- he was busy, you know, doing um, other TV shows and stuff. So mm, it, mm-hmm. I was kind of at the end of the, that list, I guess. Because <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, I, I just heard that Randy held held his uh, held onto his footage for a really long time. And yeah, I don't think I could have done that. <laughs> yeah, like you know, I had the whole time lapse pretty much shot by the end. Um, first part of November, end of October, you know. Wow. Um, this, you know, this was close to the end of where I was shooting when I shot this. Wow. So, yeah, I, I held on to it for quite a while. But, you know, to wait for him to write the music for it or I score it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Randy, in this shot, is this all ambient moonlight or using a uh, secondary um, light source? You know, I, I do have a lantern to the left and kind of back from the camera. But, you know, at this point, it's probably more moonlight, but once the moon went down, then the lantern, the LED lantern lit it up. Kicked in, yeah. I uh, had it hanging up about 10 feet off the ground, about 50 yards away. And, uh, you know, it kind of lights up the grass. And even the trees, you know, that far away, it would light them up some. Yeah, it's a great balance, Randy. And then this is one I shot in the end of December out in the Badlands. It's, uh, can you see this one? Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, it's a frame from a time lapse, too, and, you know, it's, there's real high, th- thin cirrus clouds, so it kind of makes the stars pop a little more. Um, you can see, like, Orion, it's just, it almost magnifies them, I guess. Yeah, it halos them beautifully. Yeah, the, the halo, you know, just makes them look big. And, and then, it's funny because uh, those clouds, normally when you have high cirrus clouds, it's a nightmare when you're doing like deep sky or a big view, but on time lapse they look really great because they're moving yeah, across. Yeah, if, mm-hmm. if they're really thin, you know, it makes them kind of a cool effect. And then this is some aurora that I shot last October, at the end of October, in Wisconsin, um, is when there's that, that big storm, is like October 25th. Yeah. Yeah. You got fantastic colors is, there. I'm yeah, it. I mean, it was so bright you could see your shadow on the ground from it. <laughs> I mean, it, it's crazy. the strongest I've ever seen. I don't. Well, that red is a rare color, right, for the aurora? It, yeah, it's. You know, from what I've seen, they're the majority of them are green, but mm-hmm. I think the mm-hmm. higher intensity, the more the more intense they are, you get the the higher. Maybe the higher ones are red. The higher That's the correct. altitude. Yeah. Red, red is a higher altitude. Mm-hmm. And then this, I uh, shot this in August, I think it was, and I lit up this whole area with two LED lanterns. It was, you know, there's no moonlight at all that night. And actually right here you can see a deer. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and the, these sunflowers are probably only two feet away from the lens. Beautiful. And then this is an old house. Um, it, this is in my new time lapse too, and uh, the camera just sits down into the field. You know. Wish I could take these kind of shots from New Jersey. Yeah, uh, and this is actually just a still. <laughs> <laughs> That's why. Dave, would you leave? Would you leave your camera outside at night? Yeah. Ah. Uh, yeah. You know, leave it out for about. Um, three to four hours, and then I pick it up, go back and pick it up later. And sh- for this shot, she had to stand still for the 30 seconds. Nice. Looks like she's Beautiful. smoking. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's about all I got. I've got Fair a photo enough. of my setup there if you want to see it. For yeah, 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 sure. Let's see. Okay. Now, there is a, uh, I, I quite often will use a, uh, an old uh, uh, pillow cover to uh, <laughs> to keep the dew off uh, as well you know you can do all sorts of other tricks but that's just one little trick so it is kind of hanging over the front of that so this funky looking thing on the front is actually the uh, the thing I use to keep the dew off there's my setup um, again a carbon fiber apple chromatic triplet uh, DSLR hooked in uh, that little silver disc thing with the, the wire running out of it is actually a, uh, an auto guider. Once I pull or align it, I just use that to make sure that I don't get any um, drift uh, or, you know, make sure that it, it remains pointed 
on the uh, on the star. Now, the thing about these German equatorial mounts is for again for the for those that are watching is the the key to using one of these is you have to get it exactly aligned with the Earth's axis so that as the Earth spins, the camera and the scope spin along with it. Um, otherwise, you'll get you'll get uh, your your stars will wind up looking like eggs. This keeps perfectly crisp, you know, nice round stars, and you can do two hours worth of photography on on a subject and, and not get that uh, smudging. So this is something again, I that, find that fantastically difficult in the southern hemisphere because there's no convenient pole star there where yeah, you're they, aiming. It's just a big, big blank space, mm. and they go, "Oh, it's yeah. easy. It's just a magnitude eight star. Just point it. That's and that's about five <laughs> degrees away. That's fine." I've never managed to do it. My do they, sky career is over since I moved to New Zealand. Gordon, do they not have, um, if, if you look at the very cone of, the, of that, uh, uh, that tripod, uh, there's actually a little, uh, uh, what they call a, a polar alignment scope. Mm. Yeah, do they not I mean, sell those for the southern hemisphere? They do. I've got a, a, a Losmandi uh, G, GM8, and um, I've got the polar alignment scope for that. For anyone whose eyes are glazing over now, this is a little kind of, uh, little <laughs> kind of like a monocular that you that has got little stars overlaid in it and a little light that lights them up. And the idea is, is that you use it to align your telescope at the pole. But honestly, like in the northern hemisphere, you have a load of really good pointers. But in the southern hemisphere, they'll be like two right next to each other, all miles away from it. And that means you've got to kind of draw a triangle that goes like this. And it's so, so difficult yeah. to get right. So I, I've given up. I've given up with high-power lung exposure stuff. It's too... I envy you guys up there now. It's, it's really up there in the northern hemisphere. <laughs> yeah, but you've got so these gorgeous that, Magellanid clouds down there in the southern hemisphere. <laughs> yeah, that is also that is true, and they're so bright you can actually nail them with like thirty seconds at sixteen hundred ISO on the, on the normal camera lens. They're huge. Those are incredible. Huge. I just want to uh, thank Ron for coming. He's got to take off. I know he's got a time constraint, so thank you very much, Ron, for coming on the show. We appreciate it. It was great. Oh, you, you betcha. Thanks for having me. This is this has been awesome, and I've been watching your guys' pictures, uh, admiring your guys' pictures for a long time, and and I'm going to continue to do so. My pictures stopped coming, but you guys are still coming. So. Um, but we'll be in touch because I, I really would like to get you guys help and, and guidance and advice on on that crowdsourcing idea that we have to, to get the pictures off the space station and out to the public a little faster. So um, sorry I had to drop off, but it, it was great hanging out with you guys. Thanks, Ron. Anytime, Ron. Thanks, Thanks Ron. Ron. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Take care, guys. Take care. Bye. Yeah, I'm sure it's the same for other people, but I would say the photos may have stopped from Ron, but the inspiration hasn't. Well, he's got he's got yeah. another what twenty four thousand to share with us. So. Yeah. <laughs> mm. I, I so well, now thankful. now that Ron's gone, I don't feel so bad about sharing mine. Mine <laughs> 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 are pretty late. In fact, this is terrible. You know, you guys are out of politeness. You know, but but I mean, it's like mine are mine are terrible. So I'm going to skate through them really quick. Um, I mentioned earlier that I really like. Can you see that picture? Yep. yep. Mm -hmm. I really like Earthshine. And this is an easy picture that you can do with normal equipment. This, this was taken... So when, when I'm talking about Earthshine, for anyone who's not, not into this, it's where you wait for the crescent moon to be really, really thin. Really, really thin. Almost like that one that Ron showed earlier. Not quite as thin as that. And what happens is if you overexpose that, you actually begin to see the rest of the moon illuminated by Earth. That's re light that's reflected off the Earth. And because so much of the Earth is blue, the light reflected is blue. And that's called Earthshine. I think I've got that reasonably right. Um, and it kind of looks a bit like an eclipse shot in a way. Here are four mm -hmm. different views that I took with a 300 millimeter lens and a normal DSLR. I think there are a couple of, a couple of second exposures. Um, so actually there's a little bit of motion there. Uh, we were talking about the rotation of the Earth that you need to counteract to stop blurring. Here I didn't. It was on a normal tripod and you can see there's a bit of motion blur. But that's meant that the clouds have moved a little bit and it felt like it was almost sat on the ocean a bit in a way. Well, that's what I thought. Um, moving on, we've not done much high power stuff, so here's, uh, here's a high power shot of, uh, of the sun. sun, and that big black dot isn't a sunspot, that's Venus, and this was a transit of, uh, of the sun. This was taken with uh, my telescope, which is a, a Teleview Genesis, which in lens terms is a 540mm f5.4, 
So in telescope terms, you talk about the aperture, so it's a, it's a 100 mil or 4 inch aperture, but in lens terms, it's 540 mil, 5.1. This is what you'll get with a 2 times teleconverter, so it's kind of double that. So I mean, it's Venus is, is... It's the original beauty spot. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and the, the sort thing about a transit is, obviously, what you can do if you're an explorer of, uh, of hundreds of years ago is you'd sail to the other side of the planet to, to witness and time this in order to work out the size of the universe and all the rest of it. But I just use it as an opportunity to get a little kind of Pac-Man bite outside of the sun. So that's a close-up of, <laughs> of Venus going over the limb there. That's and great. It's a, really cool, it's a cool thing to watch. Nice. How and fast did it move across the sun, Gordon? Oh, faster than you think, you know. It was like a few minutes. It wow. was, I mean, it wasn't moving. It wasn't a few seconds, it, but it was a case of a few minutes. Yeah. If you turn away from it and go back, it had moved quite a lot. And I wanted to get a, a picture where the uh, Venus was just touching the edge, the shadow, and I missed it. Um, but this was during the day, and I took this from a balcony of my one-bedroom flat when I was living in London in the middle of the day. Obviously, you need a solar filter to do this kind of photography, yes. and we can talk about that on the, on the stream later on. Um, don't muck about with this sort of thing because you, you will blind yourself and potentially burn out your equipment as well. Mm -hmm. So you do need proper solar filters. But once you've got that, it's all good. Here's another uh, solar shot. Um, and this shows some, um, some really big sunspot group. Let me try and find that. Where did it go? <laughs> it's down here. Darn thing. A little more to the left. Left and up. Yeah, I think you're right. No, not right, left. I'm just going to zoom out. <laughs> there it is. Who's on there first? it is. <laughs> yeah. There it is. Oh. Come on. There it is. Look at there this. Look is. at that sucker. Mm. It's huge. So if Ron was here, he could tell us how big that is. I'm just going to glibly say, that's bigger than the planet Earth. <laughs> <laughs> you have to do it in that voice as well. Billions of years ago. Mama. Billions and billions. <laughs> I, I'm only going to show one long exposure. Oh, jeez. Uh, beautiful. This, thank you. This is Comet Mitnor. I've shown this before to the, anyone who, who watches Trey's um, Hangouts and has caught me on it before will go, wait a minute, this guy's only taken 10 photos and we've seen them all now because you've <laughs> seen this one before. But it's one of my favorites. This Comet Mitnor was a small comet in the Northern Hemisphere. By the time it was visible down here, it turned into this epic comet that was massive, absolutely massive. And this was taken from a ski resort in Queenstown, where I live. Um, the lights that you see in the bottom middle of that picture, that is the light pollution of Queenstown. It's actually quite a, a considering it's such a small town, the light you get from it is quite, is quite bright. Um, but this was, this was, as I recall, with a 24 mil lens, I think. I can confirm that later. But that shows you how big that tail was. And if you brighten the exposure on this, the tail goes all the way and arcs like 180 degrees. It's like a protractor. It's, it's massive. And you'll see two tails there as well, depending on, I think, what is it? One, one's gas and one's solid. Is that right? Something like that. Or I just want to really quick uh, say thanks for Jim, to Jim for coming by. Appreciate it, man. Thank thanks, you, Jim. Jim. Amazing. Thanks, Jim. Fantastic talking to you guys. Always enjoy your photos, but never, uh, never had a chance to really talk to anybody. <laughs> just mm -hmm. always one-sided. So a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. Nice, to, nice to meet you, Jim. Cheers. Good luck with the book. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes. Um, moving on, this is my last picture. This is a, a lunar eclipse. Um, and what you can do, this was again taken with um, the, the 500 millimeter telescope that I've got. And it's quite nice when you are taking these pictures that you, instead of just aiming for, because when you first get into taking pictures of the moon or, or the sun, you get a bit depressed because you think, wow, I've got a 300 millimeter lens, that's huge. But when you point at the moon, it's tiny. Then you get a 500 millimeter lens and it's still small. Then you put a converter on it, it's a 1,000 millimeter and it's still not filling the frame. And that's when you think, wow, this thing is so bright. It's so deceptive. You know, the sun and the moon are really little. You need massive lenses to capture them. So one way around that is to just show different phases of the moon or a different phase of the eclipse like I've done here and, and do a kind of composite shot. So this, this was an eclipse um, in New Zealand about, I think it was 2007. The one last year I didn't get because it clouded over. Um, but this, this was the last one I managed to capture. I did have a make, there's a schoolboy error here. I don't know if you guys can uh, see it. Can you guess it yet? The clue is, look at the orientation of the moon. On the first two, I clearly not moved the camera. And mm. then during the eclipse, I got bored and took pictures of something else, put the camera back on again, and of course it rotated. 
I rotated the camera. I'm actually rotated by almost <laughs> 180 degrees. It's terrible. Um, and that's um, that's that's a really important thing. I think you guys can obviously talk more about this. That when you are doing any kind of astrophotography, whether it's quick exposures like this or long exposures, you've got to be so careful with your equipment not to move it, to keep things consistent, because you can get really caught out. And this was just a really silly thing that during the during totality, I think I moved the telescope to take a picture of something else, and that was dumb because if I'd realized I was going to do a composite like this, don't touch anything. Leave everything the way it is. Um, but I, I blew it. But I still quite like the, the composite there. So those are my, um, those are my shots. Oh, those are great. And Gordon, I got that uh, eclipse photo for you too, just because uh, you asked. This was the one with uh, the mm -hmm. eclipse moon rolling down Shasta. Nice. That is fantastic. That is awesome. <laughs> and the and the one reason why I really like this one was just because it was single frame, no no HDR, no multiple exposure, just straight out of the camera. And that was kind of the really nice thing about it is that there wasn't any kind of post processing have to do with with this image, which was really nice. Mm. Um, also, for everyone else who is still left listening to us. Um, Ben and I, we were organizing a landscape astrophotographer's circle, and mm -hmm. uh, I still got that going, so I'll definitely uh, post that with uh, the addition, of course, with all the talent that's on here, and uh, everyone else can check that out, and hopefully we can share that away, and uh, yeah, <coughs> enjoy. Yeah, hey, cool. Gordon. I, yeah, uh, go for just it. Just one thing, it's uh, um, one of the things I did with, with G+, because... Like I said, I've learned so much from from all the photographers. You know, a here these these gentlemen here with the, the you know their Star Trail shots and and Milky Way shots have just like got me pumped and, and everything like that. Um, I started showing some of my deep sky photography, and there was so many questions um, that I actually decided to start a little group. Um, so it's it's kind of a shameless plug here, but so I've got something going on Google Plus uh, Astrophotography 101 group. And uh, I give tips, tricks, and uh, homework assignments. Uh, for instance, just cool. to, to let you know, <laughs> uh, started out with shooting the moon. You know, that was uh, assignment one. Uh, and it's actually being, you know, pretty well received. And it's nothing that, you know, is rushed. Um, it's been going for a few months now, and we're still on assignment two, which is, is shooting very quick, you know, star trails. Um, so for anyone out there who's, who's interested in learning about it, um, you know, I am... I won't profess to be, you know, to call myself a master. It's a, it's a very steep learning curve um, to do astrophotography. I'm still learning, um, but I'm sharing as I go along, you know. So anyone that wants to come along and, and enjoy the ride with me as, as we learn together, um, I'll share what I can. So, so Darrell, is that a G plus page? Yes, it is. Yeah, it's a astrophotography space 101 space group. That's cool. I mean, what I, what I thought we could do now, I've got to um, head off myself soon, and I'm sure, I don't know how many people are left watching. <laughs> I mean, I'm loving it, by the way. I, think I could I hang out all night it. talking to you guys. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I'm really, really loving it. Um, but I thought what we could do is, again, stop from left to right and just say, you know, we've been showing all these kind of advanced techniques, but if you could just give one astrophotography tip, like for somebody who's got normal equipment, either in terms of location, maybe exposure settings, equipment, <laughs> Any kind of tip, as you know, because let's try and get people out and doing <laughs> doing this. That doesn't involve them, building, you know, freezing their ass off all or by sitting out all night long listening to scary animal sounds and having the police drive past. <laughs> so yes, Ben, sir, your in. top your top tip. Uh, a lot of the questions I get is people asking how do you focus on the stars, and uh, mm -hmm. one of the easiest ways to do that with a newer camera is if you have live view, is crank your ISO as high as it'll go, turn your live view on and point your camera to the brightest star that you can find in the sky and then zoom in usually on your live view you'll notice a, a fuzzy spot of light and if you zoom in on your live view and use that live view to turn your focus bring that fuzzy spot to a pinprick then your lens is set to uh, focus on the stars and pull it out of live view mode go back to your regular settings and now you got good focus on the stars now Ben when you do that you're using the screen on the back of the camera right? yep have you ever tried it um, via a laptop you say, like, if you're using a Canon, you could do it via the EOS utility, you get a bigger screen. Or yeah, Tether would that. be really nice. Uh, I usually end up in some pretty far out there places, and so I haven't brought the laptop with me. I really wish the iPads would work as a, a live second yeah. monitor for that reason. 
Um, but yeah, I believe if you had it tethered, uh, then you could definitely zoom in a lot better than just the back of your, your, your camera. You can do that with certain Android tablets with uh, an app called DSLR Controller. You can do the live view and control the camera and all kinds of stuff with it. Oh. It's, it's, only certain, it's only certain phones and certain tablets that have the USB hosting mm -hmm. function. Ah. But it's an awesome app. It is really, I mean, that's the, for me, that's the most frustrating thing about using a telescope instead of a camera lens, is that the telescope is manual focus only. Mm -hmm. And I shake quite a lot. And when I'm, when I'm turning the, the little wheel to adjust the focus, yeah. the image is doing this. Whereas when you're using an autofocus lens and you've got it connected, you know, via, say, the EOS utility if you're using a Canon model, you can just nudge that focus back and forth remotely mm. uh, while you're looking at a magnified view of it. And that is so nice to be able to nail that focus. That was always the biggest challenge for me uh, prior to my view and computer control. I love being able to do that. Yeah. Oh, that's pretty cool. It's a second monitor idea. Brad, what's your top tip? <laughs> uh, know your location. Uh, as I said before, you know we're we're scouting these locations days, probably months, sometimes even years before. Um, know where you're going and know what you're getting into before just picking up your camera gear and heading out in the middle of the night. Are you talking like in terms of physical danger? Um, having a uh, rock fall on your arm and having to saw it off? Well, you know, you know, you actually, you never know. I mean, if if I went to the the waterfall area where I shot the Orionids meteor shower, and I went there without knowing anything about the place, and I was there with just a headlamp and a flashlight, I I would have gotten in a little bit of trouble, definitely. I mean, I, I mean, just out of pure safety, know what you're getting into. You know, like hiking up to Delicate Arch uh, in Arches National Park. You have nothing but um, Karen's guiding the way. You don't have a clear marked trail. And if I didn't scout that place before, <laughs> who knows if I would have been able to get out. And it would have been a cold, miserable night up there. Any potential animal attacks? No, never. I mean, and, you know, on, when I was on the PCT, I, I really got used to animals and. You know, I had my bear experience in the Sierras and mountain lion and stuff. And, you know, you, I mean, read read your basics and go over, you know, just stand tall, don't run, and uh, pray. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Daryl, do you have a, a top tip? Um, actually, I was going to say, uh, I was going to say the same thing as Brad about knowing your location or even setting up the shot in the daytime. Um, but uh, other than that... Um, the, the, the number one thing I can say is is have fun doing it. I mean, go out there, experiment. It's 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 the best way to learn. Um, you know, get out there, take a, you know ten second shots, twenty second shots. Um, you know, see what kind of result you get. It, uh, uh, the only other thing I, I do is uh, um, you know during your experimentation, find out what your camera's sweet spot is with the ISO. You know, crank it up. You know, as much as you can. Play with your aperture. Uh, you know settings because each each lens is gonna react differently. Mm -hmm. Each lens is gonna have a sweet spot. So again, just don't be afraid. Um, you know, there's lots of information out there on the internet to uh, to find out how to do this sort of thing as well, uh, and just have fun with it. Join Daryl's uh, page. Obviously, that's the main one. Yeah. Randy, have you got a tip for us? Yeah, I get uh, you know a lot of people have trouble with like dew or frost getting on their lens with if especially if they're shooting time lapse. What I do is I take the disposable hand warmers yeah. and I put it on the bottom of the lens and strap it on with like a rubber band or some people use a velcro strap. Um and that that's all it takes and it'll last, you know, 6 hours and keep the lens a little bit warm, you know, just to keep the dew and frost off of it. So, Randy, for anyone who's not experienced this, it's the same as like Randy, when you get up early in the morning and you see what is. <laughs> they look like these. <laughs> yeah. I think yeah. that's what they look like. <laughs> yeah. Hey, when you said you were going to show me pictures of hotties on the internet, I was like... <laughs> <laughs> Brad, was it, uh, was it you that made the post about that? Uh, no, it was Randy, actually. It was Randy? Okay. I knew yeah, it was Randy, and I thought it was brilliant. I, I didn't think of that at all. I never I actually thought of had it the either. Same, yeah, I had the same problem when yeah. I was shooting the... You know, you know they... They uh, sell the le the lens warmers, but then you know you have to deal with extra batteries and then you know the wires and you know you can buy a lot of hand warmers for what one of those costs too. <laughs> so Randy, I, I, I think some some people watching might not know why this is a problem. I mean, it's the same thing as when you wake up in the morning and you see all the dews mm -hmm. formed on like flowers and things. That's effectively happening on your lens, isn't it? And 
and you'd be taking these pictures without realizing it, and the front of the lens is just covered in water, and you're thinking, mm -hmm. why, why is nothing appearing on my picture? Yeah, it'll just get foggy, and you won't see anything, you know, once it does that. So the solution to that is to either, what, have some sort of extension, like a, like a lens hood, or heating, yeah? Yeah, um, what I do, just take, you know, one of the hand warmers and put it on the bottom of the lens, because assuming, you know, the heat rises, and it'll just kind of keep it warm enough and burn it off, I guess. It does, you know, it doesn't get so hot it's going to hurt the lens or anything, but I've been doing that for a couple of years, and it's been working good. It basically cool. keeps the keeps the condensation from building up because it's not yeah. cold, so there's nothing for the yeah. condensation to build up on. And it, you know, I, I used it down to like ten ten below too, and it keeps the frost off. <laughs> That's awesome. Dave, it's, it's your turn now. Shoot oh, sorry, sorry. Shoot sorry. for no. the moon, Gordon. <laughs> yeah. Gordon, if I can I'm just going to throw one more quick tip out there for for, for yeah, people, yeah. just because what what Randy said kind of really reminded me of something. Um, that dew forms when your your lens barrel's colder than the outside. Um, mm. So what happens quite often if if anyone's shot outside quite a bit, if you walk in with your equipment, it's going to uh, fog up on you. Uh, one little trick that I use and uh, I actually have it on on uh, the astrophotography page is I take a cooler with me and I throw my camera in the cooler and mm -hmm. I just bring it in the house, let it warm up uh, in inside the cooler. That way, you're not going to risk getting mold and all that, you know, the nasty stuff that forms in your lens when you get uh, uh, condensation in there. How about That's leaving great. your gear outside a bit? Say, if, you, if you're shooting in your backyard, should you leave your gear outside for a couple of hours, for, you know, prior to shooting? Yeah, it, it, anytime you can, you can. It, your, your gear is going to perform the best when it's uh, acclimated to your environment. Um, when you use a, you'll know this, Gordon, because you shoot through a telescope as well. Um, about perfect or about where you can get is about two degrees uh, warmer than the outside. Uh, any more than that, and, and this is kind of what scared me to use the, the hotties with the uh, a telescope. On the lens it shouldn't be so bad, but when you get into a telescope, uh, you can actually get uh, convection currents inside the tube. So <laughs> I, I'm going to try the hotties to see if they work, because uh, that's, that's a heck of a cheap way to do it, because those, uh, those warmers are pretty expensive. Yeah, they do all those little accessories that just attach on and warm it up. And yeah, yeah I like so the I mean, body. if you've got a warm lens and you're trying to shoot in a cold environment, you're going to get uh, convection current. So yeah, if you can if you can acclimate your lens slowly to the cold, and then when you bring it inside, acclimate it uh, slowly to the warmth, you're going to be far better off. Dave, I feel I feel bad. We've not included you too much here. That's I right. kind I of follow Trey, Trey's uh, previous lead, and you know, talk to us. <laughs> I think you can also use Ziploc bags to get it acclimated um, instead of a cooler barrel. I think you can try that too. If uh, somebody doesn't want to carry a cooler okay. around, just pop a Ziploc bag in your pocket. If you're going to come back inside from a cold environment, put your lens in the Ziploc and then let it warm up and then take the lens out. Oh, there you go. I've also heard that Cool. Too. Well, I think, should we, should we wrap this up? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Sounds, sounds good. This has been fantastic. I've really, I've really enjoyed it. Not least because Trey wasn't here and I got to take over. So it feels like <laughs> a member of a maniac. And I hope it's not upset too many people. It's like, Trey, we, it's like when we just takes the week off and the guest, the guest host comes in. You know? Yeah, that's right. Uh, should we just quickly run through? Tell us where we can find your pictures. Ben, how do people find you? Uh, find me on the website, thestartrail.com. Or right. on Google+. Plus. And oh, you can find me on uh, goldpaintphotography.com. And Google Plus, of course. Daryl? Google Plus. That's Darryl easy, Dave. Ben, yeah. You can find me on Google Plus by going to plusdave.com. Randy? DakotaLaps.com, and I'm also on Google Plus. Cool. You can also find me on Google Plus. Uh, I'm Gordon Lang. I'm editor of CameraLabs.com. That's where you'll find me. And as soon as I've finished talking to you guys and had some dinner, I'm going to post some high ISO comparisons with this G1X, so if this is a camera you're nice. interested in, check that out. I thought I'd use that plug shamelessly, though. I hope you uh, approve. <laughs> <laughs> thanks so for having us, guys. Thanks. thanks so much. Right. Thanks so much, everyone, for coming on. Thanks to Ron, Garen. I don't know about you guys. It was such a... Well, I think we were all in awe. It was like, it's an right astronaut. It's Ron, Garen. Absolutely. Yes. Oh, Fantastic. And, you know, to share so much time with us. That was great. And thank you, Trey, for getting us all together. I'm sorry for hijacking it, but I hope uh, you enjoy either the live show or the recording. Yeah. Cheers, straight. Right. Thanks. So everybody, Thanks. Uh, wave goodbye to the camera. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>